Very good morning to you all, and welcome to well, apparently the best day of the year, the first day of the Euromoney ECBC Colour Bond Congress. The team at Euromoney always makes fun of me for saying that, but I don't care. I'm happy to be here at this wonderful event again. Um, unfortunately, it's only virtual. We're not in Barcelona this year, maybe next year. And we're going to start, or I'm going to start my sessions this year with the single most important player in the Colour Bond market. They buy more bonds than anyone else. They set the green agenda, they provide the funding that squeezed covered bond issuance, as we heard about from Christoph Reiger in his keynote just now. And in their spare time, they're responsible for the monetary policy for 350 million citizens. But it's the role as supervisors of the largest covered bond issuers that we're going to start off with today. So I'm more than delighted to be able to welcome Eduard Fernandez Bolo, member of the supervisory board of the ECB, to the virtual stage. Mr. Fernandez Bolo has undertaken many roles in the field of bank supervision, initially in France with the Banque de France and the ACPR, but with also wider responsibilities representing France, the Bar Committee, and the board of the EBA. He started his five year term on the supervisory board of the ECB with, I might say, impeccable timing, just before COVID started to kick in. And it's a recovery from the COVID pandemic and the risks of the banking system that it produced that he has prepared some slides with us, uh, for us today. Edward Fernandez Bolo, thank you so much for joining us. Can I ask you please to share with us your thoughts on that all important topic? Uh, thank you very much, Richard, and I am really quite delighted to have this opportunity to present to this audience what are the main points of attention of the ECB banking supervision. Let me just then also clarify that uh, uh, because I work on supervisory board, I will present exclusively the points of the banking microprudential supervision function of the ECB. And you know the separation principle inside the ECB makes it that I cannot uh, myself uh, talk about the monetary policy side of the ECB. So this is what we, we are here. But of course, this uh, banking supervision is fully coordinated with the monetary side in order to be sure that we have this uh, move getting out of the crisis mode to the recovery and new normal in the financial world. Um, and it's for this path to the new normal that I wanted to present what are our supervisory point of attention so we can go to, uh, <coughs> to the presentation uh, and, and the slides there. Uh, you will see that we have three main points that we uh, want to address that are, I will say, very immediate uh, point of attention, uh, then uh, immediate to short term and a medium term point of attention. So if we can go to the slide number two, uh, we will see that uh, the first issue we want uh, to raise to, uh, with um, uh, the banks today is the need to avoid risk complacency. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that, of course, we are in a situation which is, uh, from the point of view of the global economic outlook, uh, perfectly improving. Uh, and the, uh, in the projections of the ECB have kept improving and they are still there. And even maybe more important, I would say not only the outlooks are improving, but the uncertainty of the outlooks is greatly diminishing, which is a very important issue because that was one of the features of this crisis that the, uh, I would say the, the, the uncertainty of the future developments was extremely high. Uh, when it uh, started. So now we, uh, we can say that uh, we are confident that we are in a macro outlook that is continuously improving. Uh, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless uh, this improvement, which uh, uh, is uh, putting away the idea that we will have a, a big uh, rise in credit risk in, uh, uh, immediately in the European Union, is producing some uh, phenomenons that we can qualify as underrating of risk. And this is where we want to give the message. Uh, uh, we have to avoid risk complacency and we have 
to be sure that the mechanism of risk supervision uh, are doing well in the banks. And this is where we have some message of potential. So we can go uh, uh, to uh, the, the slide, uh, next slide. And uh, here is what we see, the reduction in uncertainty, which is very, very important. And you see it is in the part of, uh, uh, of the right, it's the green curve. You've seen an enormous spike at the beginning of the crisis. And now uncertainty is almost, it's a bit higher than in the last time, but almost gone back to the, uh, to the previous uh, times before the crisis. So we go now to the next slide. Here we can see the points of attention. And what are the points of attention? We know, the first one I, I want to underline, that this crisis has had a very diverse impact uh, in the sectors. You have in the, uh, in the left side of the slides the, the impact by sectors, and you see that there are some like accommodation, like tourism, that are much more impact than the rest. So one will expect that the risk mechanism of the banks will be able to discriminate between this risk. And for the buildup of the risk in the way ahead, it's extremely important to have correctly measurement of this risk. But what we see in the right hand of the, uh, these slides is that when you take a sample of the big European banks, a majority of these big European banks are calculating in their internal risk systems probabilities of default of sectors that are heavily impacted by the crisis, like you see there the accommodation sector in this graph. Well, you see the banks that are in the red box, that is more or less two thirds of the market, are predicting probabilities of default of the accommodation sector that are lower than before the crisis. Well, this is something, of course, that is completely counterintuitive. But what does that mean? That means that the risk measurement systems are not working well. Why? Because they are calculating probabilities of default for the last 10 years. And now you have two years of government support with no default that are replacing two years where there were defaults. So the automatic calculation of probability of default is saying that it's safer now to give credits to the accommodation sector than it was before the crisis. Well, this is clearly no sensible risk management uh, system in the banks can rely on that. <laughs> so this is precisely a measure we need to be uh, in using in the risk management of the banks, uh, mechanisms that avoid, I will say, the, the problem of uh, backward looking that the normal indicators of risk has given. Because if not, we are underrating the, uh, the credit risk precisely on the sectors that are most affected by the crisis and will be most affected by the crisis when going forward, when the government support will be retired. And we all know it will come. Uh, government support has been effective. It has uh, clearly smoothened out the crisis, but it will not last forever. So we cannot make uh, risk measurements based on the uh, continuation of the uh, of this government support, which is what implicitly these uh, probabilities of default are. Doing. S second point, and we go to the next uh, slide. We see also something that is very striking. We are in the sector of uh, leverage lending, and we see that uh, the numbers during the crisis of leverage lending are not going down; they are rather they're going up lending has been going up, but also, and that's on the right-hand side, that the covenants of the, the leverage buyout are becoming lighter and lighter. And we see no, uh, no impact on the distribution of credit. So here there also, clearly that says that uh, the implicit probability of default that is inside the fact of having less guarantees is not being taken into account. Uh, we see no restriction of lending, even with increased risk. There again, for us, it's a, it's a symptom where clearly something is not going very well in the risk measurement systems of the banks. Uh, 
let me add to that that of course we have the the markets are uh, very high and so the, there is a, uh, an asset pricing that may also be uh, a bit over optimistic from that and so this is the first message, because this is happening now, banks are the, uh, giving credits now, they are doing leverage uh, uh, lending now, we need clearly to correct the, the deficiencies of the risk parameters to be sure that we are not building up exposures with underrate risk. So that's my first. Now let's go to the next slide and to, to the second, uh, which may be seen as not so uh, short term, but your message is it is short -term. environmental risk. Why? Because we are not here talking about um, uh, the climate evolution that may take some years. Unfortunately, maybe not so, so many as uh, people uh, thought at the beginning before be uh, creating economic disruptions but to the approach by the banks to these risks. Uh, and this approach, it needs to be enhanced now. Uh, and we need to start the journey precisely because it's a difficult journey, it's a complicated journey to, uh, to embed this environmental risk approach in the, uh, in the risk appetite, in the strategy, in the business models of the banks, because it's very important, we need to begin now. Uh, you know this uh, everything that has happened in this uh, uh, in this summer like the uh, commission program the report from the uh, the intergovernmental panel unfortunately some events uh, like the fires and others everything is pointing out to the fact that uh, there is an increased urgency dealing with environmental risks so that we just cannot wait uh, we uh, uh, you know that the objective policy objective general policy objective is global warming uh, lower than 2%, and we are in a, a path that is rather akin to 3.8, so, uh, so rather the double than what is, uh, that is the objective. So if we want to reach the objective credibly, we must begin now. So that means and that we will be rather sooner than later having a regulatory approach also in the field of banking of this week. We don't have it yet, for the time being there is no specific regulation at all for environmental risk, uh, but we will have it and the banks should prepare for it. In our assessment, uh, pillar one treatment, which is not unlikely, we think it will come, uh, will not be the first mover. What can be expected is that we have prescriptions in the field of risk monitoring and governance pillar two and pillar three. First, risk monitoring. This is, again, the, uh, the part where we want to deliver the message. We have to identify the vulnerabilities to environmental risk. Banks say to us, it's not easy. That's why we have to do it. <laughs> That's why we need to begin doing it now and not later. So we have to develop risk metrics and based on risk metrics, an overarching risk strategy and a business model that should be compatible, should be made compatible with the transition scenarios that uh, uh, the banks will be required to foster, in fact, by their activity. So that's the internal strategy of the bank, which is the main concern from our point of view as micro uh, prudential supervision. Uh, and to foster this development in the banks, we will have two tools, certainly a pillar two that is tailored uh, requirement that we can, can make on a bank by bank basis hmm, to incentivize the credibility of the strategies and the effectiveness of the implementations, but also a disclosure hmm, where, of course, uh, uh, it's no need to tell in these days that the issue of uh, potential greenwashing is a, quite a serious one. <laughs> uh, so we will need to develop an approach to ensure that uh, uh, the pill of uh, three uh, transparency and disclosure is not only convergent, but also uh, credible. So the ECB is really developing uh, its approach there. Uh, we have already made uh, a survey of the situation of the banks today. 
And let me just say very shortly what are our consequences, uh, what we take from this survey, that the banks are really, I would say, taking it as a serious issue, but not yet treating it enough seriously. Why not yet treating it enough seriously? Because, and it's a real issue, they say we are not able to develop a risk matrix. But, which is clear, but really this is why we need to develop. And that's why the next step for ECB will be to develop a quantitative stress test next year. This is intended to uh, make the banks develop their risk metrics. And let me underline the specificities of this stress test. This, is a, this will be a bottom-up stress test. So what we wanted to enhance is the internal capabilities of each bank based on its own risk metrics to measure the impact of environmental risk in all the categories, traditional categories of um, risk measurement in the banks. Uh, that means uh, in, uh, in credit risk, liquidity risk, and other types of market risk, in all the types of risk. Uh, we need to be able to translate these risk metrics in the risk appetite uh, of the bank, and for this we need numbers. We are not in a position, and we recognize that, right? we are not in a position to harmonize completely these risk metrics. We are not asking the banks to harmonize. We are asking to develop something that is consistent and will be able to uh, make them develop their own risk appetite, their own strategy. And basis on that, to be able also to disclose uh, the result of the strategy and the actions uh, they, they are taking. Uh, so this is clearly something that we need to do now, we will pursue it next year, and we are really keen on having uh, reliable outcomes starting next year, reliable outcomes bank by bank basis. Again, we are not saying we will have a full harmonized matrix of environmental risk next year, but we need the banks to have their own uh, uh, risk matrix. And then let me go to the third point that I wanted to mention, which is here, um, of course, something that needs to be acted now, but it is a bit more medium term. Uh, we really want, and this will be linked to the embedding of environmental risk, to address the challenges of business sustainability in the Eurozone. We know that we have a specific European issue about banking profitability in the Eurozone. Uh, we are consistently, uh, the European banks are consistently less profitable than uh, the peers in other regions. So if we go to the next slide, we will see that the situation as the banks themselves, they uh, foresee it, will be improving. Hmm? They foresee an improvement. But this improvement is only taking the, uh, the, uh, the banks back to the level where they were before the crisis, which is more or less uh, something like uh, uh, between 4 and 6% return on equity, and still, still extremely close to the cost of equity. So even what the banks forecast as the, I would say, uh, uh, what will be their expected year going out of the crisis, is still a very low profitability by international standards. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see that even this limited progress that the banks are forecasting, we may have, from the point of view of, uh, uh, of the European supervision, reasons to think that this could be uh, a bit optimistic. So again, if we change the slide and go there, uh, we will see that uh, uh, the return of equity is still for most of the banks, most of the banks, the majority, the simple majority of the banks, under the cost of equity. So, so the, this is the norm. And we see also that the cost income ratio of the banks in Europe, even if we believe the forecast, are still rather flat. There's a slight decrease, but there's no essential improvement. And this is even uh, without taking into account that we do think that there's some over-optimistic projections there. As we go to the next slide, um, 
we, uh, I will just expand on why we think these forecasts, which are modest, are uh, indeed over-optimistic. It is because the impairment charges that are foreseen are extremely low, extremely low. And even if uh, we can take the, the issue that uh, uh, it's true that uh, the credit risk has been low and will stay low, this is not consistent with the uh, one-off events of credit that in the past have ever occurred. These bank profitability forecasts are relying on the fact that there will be no big one-offs in the years ahead. Let me say that from a banking supervision point of view, this is quite optimistic. Second point, this is also relying on the fact that there will be uh, non-financial income, essentially commission income, grow in a very, very sustainable and important manner. And again, when we see the past records, we are not convinced that this path is consistent with the history we've seen. Third point was something that is clearly optimistic is the loan volume projections. Because on the side of the cost of funding and of the funding mix, there we have less reservation because we've seen that the banks are rather conservative on the spreads. Uh, in fact, the latest uh, um, evolutions of inflation measures have been uh, like for other projections uh, that, that can have some conserve, some impact on the spreads were not factored in. So uh, the assumptions were rather conservative. The assumption about availability of uh, uh, low cost fundings were not so optimistic. They were rather reasonable conservatives, but they compensate that by saying the growth of the lending will be so much that in fact, we will have uh, an increased revenue on also on uh, on the net, on interest rates. Here again, we really think that this is not completely warranted. And the last point is that, of course, uh, some macro assumptions and uh, here and there are completely not in line with recent developments, particularly uh, regional uh, developments. So, what's our message there is that still the banks have to make additional efforts to ensure the sustainability of their projections uh, of the profitability. And that means for us two important things, uh, they, that they need to try to reap the synergies of the internal market. We still think that, that there is room for that. Uh, that the, the European banks have not sufficiently taken up the possibilities of internal markets. And the second part where we need more efforts is on the digitalization venues, where uh, we think that uh, the banks should have a more, more investment in innovation and digitalization to be able to break uh, the, uh, the structural challenge to the profitability that we have uh, in the Eurozone and the European Union market. So these are really our key concerns today, and I'm quite happy to now engage in dialogue with the issues that you may raise. Th thank you very much. Um, you've raised so many topics there that I, I have about 100 questions to ask you, and I have about two minutes left to do that. So I'm going to have to um, just focus on one I think particularly, um, particularly was wondering about during your presentation. When you talk about the environmental um, stress scenarios, you speak a lot about the fact that it's a bottom up and you're encouraging banks to develop their own risk metrics. Um, the nature of scenario modeling is extremely diverse. We've got a lot of different methodologies, different metrics being considered from starting assumptions. If you have a bottom up approach rather than a, a top down approach, finding what the metric should be, isn't there a risk that lack of comparability? Okay, I can report on this scenario, or I can report that metric, and that makes it difficult to compare results of different banks. Uh, an important procedure. We will furnish some scenarios that the, the bank should have to, uh, to test, uh, but it is the uh, the modeling of the testing that uh, remains bank specific in a bottom up. But of course, we will provide some scenarios that will be consistently checked 
to buy all the banks. Huh? And so that gives us a way of comparing. It's, uh, and will be interesting to draw the lessons on how it is. But as I said, we are in a, in a field where what we want is to enhance the consistency of the risk appetite, the risk framework of the bank with their risk parameters. So what we want to be to have is internal consistency. So that's what we are aiming at in this first exercise. We are not ruling out, and this is a journey that we will repeat this exercise later and uh, we will progress in harmonization. But the first thing is to push the banks to have their own internal risk metrics and to be able to define a risk appetite on that. And for this risk appetite, they should be able to stress test the situation. And it's clear that different banks have a very different situation in their ability to do that at the moment. Um, even mapping of portfolios to the taxonomy is vastly different between different banks. Um, are you going to be verifying how accurate their predictions are? It's like you say, this is a journey. You're going to be checking, like you have with capital that you have signed off to use IRB and then not signed off standardized. Mm -hmm. Is there an equivalent verification of internal models? Um, we are. We will be rather seeing the quality of the inputs this time, huh? how they elaborate the risk matrix. Huh? Uh, because uh, one of the great issues that the bank says is we are not. We don't have the data to make the inputs, <laughs> so we cannot begin really modeling because we don't have the raw data. We are saying you can construct. Them. And it is this, construct proxies, construct the data from the available. Ask your clients the data that you need to construct your proxies. And this is what we will be uh, formal checking. Uh, how are the ability of the bank to construct the data? Then afterwards, the parameters, I think this will rather be to a second. We will, of course, uh, have a consistency check, but this will not be the uh, main point of uh, attention in this first exercise of the, of, uh, of the stress test. Again, we are trying to enhance the capability to stress test. And we'll, the harmonization will start the journey there, but just start the journey. Hmm. That's something which definitely comes across. It's the start of the journey. And that's no. important. The, the urgency is, is obviously important. I would love to ask you about all of the other topics that you, um, that you, that you touched on. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do that. We've, we've already overrun. So, uh, so an enormous thank you for participating today, for your, your slides and your comments. Um, thank, thank you. Bye, Pat. Um, and please, we now have a, a short break before our next panels. We have a couple of workshop panels in about 25 minutes. Credit Agricole will be um, asking about the investors and their reaction to recent events. TZ will be hosting a workshop on tapering and ESG issuance as a way of, of managing volatility in the primary markets. Please come back in about 20 minutes and make your choice between those two. Until then, thank you once again to Eduardo, Eduardo Fernandez-Bolo. Thank you for watching. <laughs>